I know. I, all right. All right. I missed an introduction. You set? Yeah. We're good. Okay. Thumbs up. All right. Good morning. Oh, you can do better than that. Good morning. It's almost spring in Buffalo. People's juices should be flowing. So, so welcome. Um, this is, I can't even remember, the fourth or the fifth conference where we're having our performing providers, provider systems uh, report out to the community, and we're glad to have you all here. Um, just a few housekeeping items. You have cards on your tables for questions. So if you have any questions for our panelists, who I'll introduce in a moment, uh, please write those in the card and we'll pick them up. And then uh, after they make their, their opening remarks, we'll, we'll ask them some questions. So your questions are welcome. Um, we'd like to thank you for joining us. We'd like to thank the Performing Provider Systems for sponsoring this. And behind the scenes, all the good hard work is done by Kate McLaughlin from the uh, Health Foundation for Western and Central New York and Tara Maving from the P2 Collaborative. So we're grateful for uh, uh, them pulling everything together. So thank you. Um, I'd like to introduce our speakers. And starting from my far right is Phyllis Gunning. And Phyllis, your title is? Sorry? You can just tell me all Director of Clinical, okay, thank you. Amy White Storfer, who's the Executive Director of the Community Partners of Western New York PPS. Michelle, per, uh, Michelle Mercer, who's the Chief Clinical Integration Officer at Millennium Collaborative Care, and Al Hammonds, who's the Executive Director of Millennium Collaborative Care. Um, I'm John Craig from the P2 Collaborative, and apologies to our panelists, let's face it, we're all here today to meet Nora O'Brien Surik, who will come up in a moment. Nora, why don't you just stand up real quick and just wave. You'll, Nora will come up. Nora, if you don't know, and you probably do know, uh, Nora is the new uh, president and CEO of the Health Foundation for Western and Central New York. Um, she's learning a lot. I've heard wonderful things. She's a sponge, and she's wonderful. This is the, the, these are the reviews. I thought it might be nice right now if Nora stood up and we went around and everybody at every table just kind of stood up and introduced yourselves so Nora could learn everyone's name. <laughs> or maybe, maybe not. All right. Um, so healthcare leaders of Western New York. What's new? Um, I was at a conference last week and somebody quipped a line. They said it was a saying, uh, may you live in interesting times. Uh, it's a Chinese saying according to him. I actually looked it up. It's not a saying, it's actually a curse. Um, so may you live in interesting times. And my question to you is, do we live in interesting times? Um, people feel a little bit stressed out. I know there's a lot of confusion, a lot of anxiety and a lot of uncertainty. So we're going to do a little group therapy before we turn it over to the panelists. And I thought it might be helpful to take a look back and then do some forecasting into the future because we have a foolproof model for forecasting the future that we've developed at P2. And I'm going to share some of that in a moment. But I thought for group therapy, we could go through the four stages of DISRIP. And I'm going to be looking to see if people kind of smile and nod and go along with this. But the first stage, when we first met, before these folks were even hired, uh, was irrational exuberance, right? Six billion dollars with a B to reform health care and involve community-based organizations in a more meaningful way. So this room was packed when we had the first meeting because we all came here thinking, I'm going to get me some of that, right? Six billion dollars. We thought this is going to be a great grab. It's going to change the community and all of our organizations are going to be swimming in money. Unfortunately, that meeting ended with Ann Monroe, and I know Ann's here, I saw her real quickly. Ann, Ann kind of very nicely, but, but very firmly, wa wagged her finger and said, the money's not just going to flow to you, you've got to show some value. So we all ran back to our offices and entered the second stage of DISRIP, which I'd called semi-rational exuberance. And we looked at our organizations and said, you know what, we're going to show some value. Our, our organization's terrific. We've, we, we, we work with 500 people a year. It's great. And we've got these wonderful programs that we love, and our staff is so dedicated. We're, we're going to show value, and these PPSs are going to be tripping over themselves trying to give us their money. That didn't quite happen either, did it? Um, so we came back for the second convening, and we reached the third stage, which was kind of uh, resigned uh, acceptance. We realized that the PPSs have their own issues, their own uh, concerns, and frankly, their own obstacles for pushing money out to the community-based organizations. And we realized maybe it's not going to be that easy after all, and maybe there's not gobs and gobs of filthy lucre coming our way. Maybe there's not. So then we looked a little bit more, and now with everything that's going on in Washington and other places, I think we've reached stage four, which is um, excuse me, resignation and confusion, or New York State likes their acronyms, I call that RAC, right? We're in the RAC <laughs> stage. 
So we're, we're, we're not sure what's going on. We really don't know, and we are confused. I think everyone's confused because we're getting all sorts of signals. So the two pieces of good news. We're going we're gonna to segue to some really, really bright, very, very community-oriented people who are going to tell us where they're at and hopefully give us a sense of where we're going. The other piece of good news is, again, the P2 Collaborative, in conjunction with some of the best minds in Western New York, have developed a foolproof forecasting model, which I'm going to share in a moment. And I guarantee that if every forecast doesn't materialize and come true, we will refund you the cost of admission today. All right? Your cost of admission today. All right. So we call this the P2 eight ball. You might remember this. We, we've worked on it, and we're going to ask this some questions and see what we say. So a, th a good threshold, we have all heard about value-based payment. So if the Affordable Care Act is, uh, is repealed, will value-based payment go away? And the P2 eight ball says, <laughs> my sources say no. So that's interesting. If you think about what's going on with MACRA, uh, MIPS, APMs, the fact that MACRA enjoyed really, really strong bipartisan support, including support from uh, HHS Secretary Tom Price, that's moving us towards value-based payment for certain types of services and for certain types of populations. And that's probably not going to go away. So we're probably right so far. Another question is, will the Affordable Care Act be repealed today? And the P28 ball says, ask me again later. So sorry, <laughs> got to write on that one. It might not be that much soon. So what should we do, P28 ball? And it, the response is, stay in school. So a career in academia seems really, really appropriate right now. So that's the P28 ball. If anybody wants, we, we, we will be selling these for $8.99 after, uh, after the speakers <laughs> today. And again, they're guaranteed, guaranteed to work. But now we're going to turn it over to Nora O'Brien Surik. And Nora, if you've seen her biography, biography or her video or heard anything about her, you know that Nora has an extremely strong uh, background in geriatrics and geriatric care. She's a geriatric social worker, but she's also quick to point out that she has experience working with children as well. So she's got people nailed from cradle to grave in terms of her knowledge. And one of the things you'll find, Nora, is, is Buffalo really is the land of uh, instant karma. So you know what, what you sow comes back to you real, real quickly in Buffalo. And everything I've heard, and, and Nora's been out and about already, and, and your reputation has already been established as somebody who's uh, very bright, very eager to learn, very open, approachable, and just wonderful to work with. So we expect great things from you, uh, not necessarily today, right now. You've got some time. Um, but I'd like to turn it over to you, and good luck. Thanks. Oh, good morning. Thank you, John, for that very warm welcome. And thank you all for the wa warm welcome that I've been receiving. It really is an honor and a privilege for me to be here with you today and to be the new president of the Health Foundation for Western and Central New York. As you know, I follow um, the great Ann Monroe, um, who is here today. And it is such an honor um, to be coming in after Ann, and also very daunting. I know that um, she's just an established leader and has been a, a true passionate person in, in Disrupt and, and ensuring that there's quality health care and access to health care um, in this area. And I, I hope to continue in her legacy um, and to make her proud, um, as well as the board and as well as the staff. The wonderful staff that um, Ann has brought on to the Health Foundation that I now get to work with, whose, whose reputation had um, preceded my, me coming on board, and I'm just so lucky to be working with fabulous, exceptional, and expert people. So John already told you a little bit about myself. You know that I come from the John A. Hartford Foundation, and that mission is to improve care for older adults across America. And at the John A. Hartford Foundation, we tackle the same issues that you're tackling now, really trying to look in a national scale, how can we improve care for older adults, but really for everyone in society? Because when you improve care for older adults, you're really improving care for everybody. Because from, as John was saying, from the cradle to the grave, you know, it's all about quality care, and it's all about access to care, and it's all about affordable care. And the models of care that really bring the the evidence-based outcomes that we need, but reducing the healthcare cost, you know, the triple aim, right? So decreasing cost, increasing quality, and increasing satisfaction. And that's what we're all here to do and to talk about today and what Disrupt is all about. And it is really a pleasure for me to be here. I'm new to Buffalo, so I'm new to the foundation relatively, although I've worked with some of the staff before um, on this um, 
bringing access to quality care across the country, and, and particularly here and, and digging down deep into the western New York area. But I'm new to the Buffalo area, and I'm falling in love with it already. So um, I was told about Wegmans, and one of the first things that we did when I got here, we went to Wegmans, and it was like walking into Disney World. <laughs> and my husband and I are now looking for a home to buy, and the first thing he does is, let me see where, how close it is to a Wegmans. <laughs> So fortunately, we are moving to an area where there are three within a 10 minute drive. So it's really fun. Um, and I'm looking forward to getting to know all of you as well and to get to know more about the organizations that you work for and the people that you are working for, that you are really caring about and passionate about to make sure that they continue to receive the quality care that they deserve. Um, I know um, from all my experience in my career that nothing is done um, by one foundation. It takes multiple foundations, but more importantly, it takes multiple partnerships with people who are actually on the ground doing the work and who are in the know, and that is you. So there's no way that I can be effective as a leader now here in this region, also that the Health Foundation cannot really be a leader unless we know what it is that you need, um, what your constituents need, and how we can best help you to partner and to learn and to grow. And that's what this collaboration is all about. That's why you're here today. And I hope to continue that as well. And I look forward to you being in touch with me, um, as well as with the staff, to keep us informed. Because you know I don't want to just make an assumption. We know what assume means. I want to know from you because I know from downstate and I know from other areas of the country, but I don't know this area and I don't know what you know. So please help me to learn that. So feel free to reach out to me. You know how to reach me through the website. Um, send me an email, call my phone, and I'll be responsive to getting back to you and to setting up meetings with you. So and speaking of communicating with me, you know, we need to keep the lines of communication open, as I'm saying. So that's what this is about, coming together, talking about how to work together, what is it that we can do to, to work better together, and to work better with the healthcare system to ensure that the, the needs are met and that the safety net isn't going to be shredded and that people have access to quality care. We are in turbulent times, as John said. These are interesting times. We don't know what's going to happen. We thought that the House was going to pass the bill yesterday. Now it might not. We don't know. So we're staying abreast of that. We're staying in communication. The staff is fabulous with, with calling other foundations, calling leaders, and, and finding out. So what is it that we do know, and what is it that you're most worried about, so that perhaps we can be ready you know, to catch that ball when it comes down and, and ensure that the safety net is still in place for whatever happens. So we're going to continue to bring people together um, going forward. We're going to look for ways to keep improving what we do, what all of you do. And I'm really looking forward to today's presentation. I, I want to learn more. I know a little bit about Disrupt. I don't know enough about it to be able to talk eloquently about it. So I'm really looking forward to today's presentations. And um, I hope that you will also find it relevant and informative. So thank you so much for welcoming me. Thank you, John. And I'm turning it back over to you. Thanks, John, and thanks, Nora. Good, good seeing all of you guys here. Uh, I'm Al Hammonds, Executive Director for Millennium Collaborative Care, and this is our regularly scheduled cadence to try to update the community on how things are going. So uh, both myself and Michelle Mercer are going to talk about care for the future for RPPS and, and how we're progressing. So this is the landscape of what Michelle and I want to talk about um, this morning uh, in terms of performance, dollars, the community, where we're headed in this big P for P, pay for performance, another acronym, as, as John alluded to, in this whole realm of what does this all mean in terms of population health, uh, population health analytics around the data. So we're going to touch on all this stuff. So this is a really great one slide snapshot of our accomplishments and kind of where we are today through the first two years. And it's, it kind of separates out even, uh, dis, you know, kind of district year two versus district year three. Uh, one of the things we're extremely proud of is around primary care. Primary care in the community are two drivers of what have to improve uh, as, we, as we drive transformation in the Medicaid population. Almost two thirds of our safety net primary care providers have achieved PCMH 2014 uh, level three. That is phenomenal. That is quite a heavy lift 
Uh, we have been very instrumental in driving that with our PPS, along with our partners themselves working really hard. 63%, uh, we, we've got our, our providers separated into tiers, so tier one and tier two pretty much captures the majority of the Medicaid lives that are considered safety net. Uh, patient engagement has been extremely, uh, we've, we've, we've built a lot of energy around that, primarily a district year one, district year two uh, effort. That's going to kind of be fading away, but it, it's generated excitement and engagement, and, uh, and, and, we're, and we're working together from a collaborative perspective. Our achievement values and funding, uh, you can see there how we're performing. This is against the state goals and how the state grades us. And then the community engagement piece, as you can see in the final box in the bottom right-hand corner, and I'm going to dig a little bit deeper into that, but this is a really good one-slide snapshot. So when we look at the district midpoint assessment, this was a big thing that was done. Uh, this was supposed to be done at the halfway po point of district. It actually happened a little bit before halfway. Uh, the whole process ended with, uh, with all the PPSs, all 25 across the state, going to Albany and presenting and seeing where they are, uh, just kind of getting a, 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 a barometer, uh, performing, you know, having to present before the uh, project approval oversight panel. And uh, overall, the results for Millennium were very positive. We did have an extremely high score around the 360 survey of our network partners in terms of responding. So we got really good feedback from our partners in the community on how we're doing, uh, both good and concerns. Uh, we, we are still the only PPS in the state with, with an actual Medicaid recipient who serves on our board uh, and, and a lot of other things that you can see there. Uh, we have a master participation agreement process of how we flow funds and engage our partners in getting the deliverables done and we got, we got uh, kudos on our reference guides of how we really dig into comprehensively and lay out for our partners how to get things done. And in our communication, social media, we have a radio show. These are highlights that the state pointed out to us against the other 24 PPSs of what they saw stood out and was, and was impressive. So when we talk about structure and sustainability, not only are we trying to do the blocking and the tackling and, and accomplish transformation in the current state, but we're trying to figure out how to make this stuff stick uh, for the long term. And, and these are the kinds of things that we're talking about, population health data analytics and building a strong infrastructure around that, care coordination services that complement what the partners already have today, value-based programs is key. Regardless of what happens on the federal and state landscape, value-based programs are here to stay and they're gonna grow tremendously over the next few years. And then we have to continue community-based organization collaboration. We feel like this is our role uh, for sustainability and moving forward. So when we talk about population health and data analytics, I showed this slide last time when we presented, but we're, we're making steps. This is a phased process. Uh, we've done the introductory, we've, we've been through discovery, and now we're kind of in that first phase of implementation. We do have data that's available to us. So we're using the actual patient engagement data and the patient activation measures, PAM surveys, that we're feeding it right into our analytics tool, uh, the Cerner Healthy Intent tool. We're getting a lot of data through, uh, through HealthyLink, which has been extremely effective, and we're starting to see that data. And then the larger hospital systems, a couple of those are feeding us data directly, uh, a couple of three, as you can see up top. And we're, be we're actually in the beginning stages with the data of risk stratification and building our patient registries. So it's really progressing well. Uh, we, have to, we have to clean and scrub the data and make sure that the data is good data to have credibility, and that's kind of where we are right now as we're rolling out training and, and getting our part. We have early adopters that are part of this process to try to test the process out. We also have a learning center. We have a uh, HW apps through the Rural AHAC partner that we have uh, around workforce development and training, which is a hub for us. So we do a lot of training through HW apps in terms of courses, whether it's cardiovascular disease, blood pressure ma medication uh, management, and those kinds of things, and all kinds of uh, our cultural competency. A lot of things are there on, our, on this site as well. I want to shift gears to funds flow. 
Uh, a, a lot of people talk about funds flow, and as John kind of alluded to, uh, overall top, top level, um, you know, our PPS was awarded $243 million. I always say that's on paper <laughs> across the five years. Uh, really, there's a lot less of that that's guaranteed, and the, and the rest of it you have to actually earn through performance, and Michelle will be talking a little bit about that. But the left-hand pie chart really talks about our massive participation agreement process uh, for district year one, and we flowed about $10 million in district year one, and you can see how that pie, how that distribution goes. And in district year two, we flowed $12 million to our, to our, to our partners, and you can see how that distribution goes. And we value uh, as a top uh, in terms of how we distribute funds based on the deliverables and what, ha what has to transform the Medicaid population, primary care, behavior health, uh, are, are two of the top areas that have to drive it, but we have to also flow funds in these other areas as well. So the skilled nursing facilities, we don't forget about the developmentally disabled, that's a population that has to get critical care, and we have to have initiatives around it, and you can see the flow of funds there, pretty self-explanatory. Um, in terms of community engagement, you didn't see a community engagement dollar figure on the, on the pie charts. On my first chart around, um, the accomplishments, we flowed $6.1 million to community-based organizations in the first two years. That's a, that's a lot of money, uh, and that's by design. We've got an example here, a list of, of a lot of different community-based activities that we're engaged in. A lot of this stuff is recent uh, that we've just done in the last district year. Uh, we are uh, proud recipients of the SOFI Award, which is the uh, kind of like a, a population health recognition from P2 around our cardiovascular disease program and the project, very collaborative with the UB School of Nursing and, and the Greater United, the Ministries Group here in, in Greater Western New York area. And you can see the variety of people here from, from the teams that, that came together to make that happen. And it's gotten a lot of energy going in the community. We're really proud of that. And now we're rolling it up into Niagara County, uh, kind of using Niagara Falls Memorial Medical Center as a hub and then spreading it out from there. Uh, and then we're obviously going to do it in the southern tier as well. I want to talk about the uh, prevention agenda portion of what we also have to focus on. It, it, it's, it's really focused on uh, a, one of the main projects, it's an anchor project for us, is a mental and emotional well-being and behavior project, really focused on changing behaviors of folks really early on in the stage. And you can see here a program that we're working very collaboratively with, Just Tell One. We're working really close with community partners, who's <coughs> excuse me, who we're working closely with, and the Mental Health Association of Erie County. Uh, there's been over 400 hits to the website. It's very well recognized on the social media. It's getting a lot of, uh, a lot of attention and, and a lot of penetration. This is really a great program around public awareness. And, uh, and we've had some challenges with some of the funding as we move forward, but it is a, this is an evidence-based program recognized by New York State to, around the prevention agenda. Some of the other CBO things that we've done around community-based organizations, really around uh, the Buffalo area and really digging into the southern tier, we've done some, uh, some, some workshops. And these are four, four initiatives that were born out of the workshop and brainstorming activities that have been really catching traction. Uh, the Hearts to Love has been really good, Healthy Lifestyles, Health and Well, and the Mother's Club. Uh, the bottom right-hand corner, which really focuses on the social determinants of health, uh, that's extremely critical around uh, making sure that people can find employment. That's key. That's one of those things that we don't get measured on directly in district, but it definitely has an impact on how people approach their health care. Also, we worked really closely on a wellness night at the Enterprise Charter School, uh, very much a community-driven event, a wide range of workshops for children and adults, including sessions, as you see listed here. Uh, we cannot forget about the, uh, the importance of dental health and dental hygiene and getting the kids involved there. And you can see the kinds of things we're doing there to, to stay engaged and active in the community. And then our radio show, we, uh, Rita Hubbard Robinson uh, does a great job with the radio show, with our Millennium Radio Show. 
this is Donald Jones, former Buffalo Bill, and, and really just helping people understand, uh, man, you got to communicate, communicate, communicate around in increasing community awareness about what's going on and how disrupt really is, make, how do you make disrupt real? Um, and and re really, the overall focus continues to be we want to reduce avoidable emergency room vis visits to the ED and, and avoidable readmissions. Uh, it costs a lot of money. It's not effective care. And we're communicating that over and over again. And we're collaborating heavily with Healthy Living Magazine, which has also been effective. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Michelle Mercer, and she's going to talk about distributors three through five and where we're headed. <laughs> okay, hi everyone. So as Al talked about, we've, we've had a lot of energy, a lot of activity around Disrupts years one and two. Uh, April 1st begins Disrupt year three for uh, for New York State, so we're looking ahead and, and uh, really paying attention to how the state is raising the bar for us. Um, so when we say districts year three through five, I don't know how to do this, oh, there it goes, okay. Um, uh, we're raising the bar. What we're referring to is uh, the fact that there's a, a seismic shift going on with our funding. So in districts years one and two, we were funded based on really engagement, reporting, uh, really in getting the district infrastructure set up, ensuring the partners are working very closely with us, we are working very closely with them. Uh, district year three, and actually it started somewhat in, in district year two, but it shifts considerably in district year three from pay for reporting to pay for performance. So as Al mentioned, we have a bucket of money over a five-year period, $243 million over five years, and that, again, truly really is on paper um, because beginning in district year three, a significant component of that funds uh, is, are tied to uh, performance. So what we are measured on, um, and we've known these performance measures and we've been talking about them with our partners, uh, we have 81 performance measures uh, in, in terms of quality metrics that the state measures us on uh, that are connected to our 11 projects and our infrastructure projects. So uh, we have a, a heavy lift around those uh, measures and really making an impact on them. So again, beginning uh, district year three, we shift to the pay for performance. Some of those measures you've all heard about um, because they're really the the, the overarching goal of DISTRIP, which is to reduce hospitalizations and avoidable ED visits by 25%. Those are truly the drivers, those are the top drivers, and also avoiding uh, potentially avoidable admissions. So we have significant dollars attached to those, and then we have several different quality metrics that roll into those types of measures that should really impact the avoidable hospitalizations and ED visits. So uh, as we shift to district year three and in recognition that we're moving to this pay for performance uh, model within uh, New York State, we're shifting our pay for our strategies and our participation agreements as well as our contracts with our community-based organizations to align with those, the shifting in the, uh, the pay for performance. So, you know, four key areas include identifying alternative uh, methods and sources of data to support the management of the metrics, uh, the population health management model that Al talked about in, in healthy intent is going to be uh, ever more important for us so that we can measure how we're doing, not only at a PPS level, but at a, a, a partner level and in a community level. Uh, we're prioritizing the high dollar, high opportunity metrics. So because 81 is a huge number to try to make an impact on. So and we recognize that. So we're we're 
analyzing those 81 measures and prioritizing the highest dollar, those that will impact us the most from uh, incentive dollars and that we believe are most impactable. Um, not just because of the money, but also because we, some of them may not be, you know, truly achievable in the end. Uh, we're developing in, in collaborative partnerships where we've, we've been going through an exercise in the PPS to identify who we may not have engaged with as heavily in districts years one and two and reaching out to those organizations. I know New York State sent out a communication as well. And so we've had organizations reaching out to us. It's a renewed energy of, hey, we haven't really participated with you. Can we, can we talk? So we're, we're going through that right now. And then also, I, again, identifying metrics uh, impacting uh, not just the PPSs and our partners, but also working with our Medicaid managed care partners because many of the measures that we're being uh, measured on are also sa the same measures that the Medicaid managed care plans are measured on uh, from New York State. So this, the strategic evolution of our service contracts, we have made, we're making a shift. Um, it's out in the community. We're talking to people. We're explaining why this shift is happening, but it, it really is driven by the, the, the change from pay for reporting to pay for uh, performance. There are several in, uh, contracts out there that are being impacted. It's not that they're going away. We're changing the model that, we're, uh, that we implemented in District Year 1. We're continuing to work with all of um, or most of the partners that are uh, already working with us with those contracts, uh, and, but our, the relationship is changing and uh, are much more aligned with not just the uh, pay for performance measures, but also uh, evidence-based models that are implemented throughout these organizations to impact the Medicaid population. So this is just a uh, picture of uh, what, I, what I've been talking about, the shift from pay for re uh, reporting to pay for performance. So as you can see, this five-year uh, funding stream allocation for all of our projects on the top the del in districts years one and two, um, and partially, um, well, yeah, throughout districts years one and two, a majority of the funds uh, were allocated to not just the reporting, but also the deliverables. So our 11 projects and the milestones and, and uh, the, the tactics to achieve the milestones that so many of you have uh, worked with us uh, on. And the bottom uh, graph shows how the percentage of the dollars increase significantly in district year three from literally in district year two, payment one was zero up to, you know, by the second payment of district year three, it'll be 55% of the funding. And just as a reminder to everyone, we get paid twice a year. That's why there's a payment one and a payment two. So New York State pays us twice a year. And